thanks for coming and being here uh, with us today for this seminar. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to be a part of this. And uh, at the end, uh, I'm going to choose a, a couple of names. We've got a couple of resources that we're going to give away to you for, for being a part of this. And um, if, if you know someone who wasn't available to be a part of this today, you can let them know that we're going to post this uh, uh, probably tomorrow uh, online on our on our uh, on our our pages so that people can see this with this information. But let me pray for us and then uh, we'll get started. Father, thank you for this evening and for the opportunity we have to gather together as, as parents to talk about uh, connecting with our students. Um, Father, thank you for the privilege that you've given to us to be parents. Uh, and it's something that we do not take lightly, God. It is a great responsibility, but I also thank you that, that you, you uh, not only call us to parent, but you equip us to parent. And so I pray, God, that we would we would trust you and we would follow you and allow you to lead us as we love on our our preteens and teens. I thank you for, for Jennifer and, and for Craig today and for what they're going to share with us. Um, thank you for our church. And we just look forward to our time together. In Jesus name that we pray. Amen. OK, I want to introduce uh, Jennifer and Craig to you. They're both um, on uh, counselors, LPCs or actually, Craig, you're LPCI, correct? I am an LPC in total. Oh, yes. That's right. But uh, they are both with Planning Seas Counseling. They have an office in Frisco, have an office in Prosper, and I'll let them talk about that. But uh, Jennifer and Craig, thanks for being here. And uh, the show is yours. We're looking forward to listening. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting us to chat with you guys tonight. Um, we spend a lot of time with teenagers in our community. And so anytime we can help equip parents with healthier tools, we are super excited to say yes to that. Um, like Jimmy said, we work at Planting Seeds and we do have an office in Frisco and Prosper. Um, we are a decently sized group practice and so try to have people on staff that cover all the bases. If you're interested or just want to reach out and find other resources in the community, um, easiest way to find us is just go to our website which is plantingseedsntx.com. So you can find out about us there and how to get a hold of us. Um, so, Craig, you want to actually, before we get started, um, all the moms and dads that are out there listening, if you guys want to grab a piece of paper and something to write with, um, that way, if questions pop up that you want to circle back to and you don't have time to type them in the chat room, you've got that. Then also we are going to hopefully give you some tools that you want to put into place. So something to jot those down with. Um, and then Craig, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, guys. So we're going to be talking about embracing our teens tonight and just kind of a lot of different aspects of that. You know, part of the first thing that we need to have with that is the awareness piece. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get used to the fact that I can't control slides. Can we go to that next one? <laughs> Um, so we're all just trying to do the best that we can. Um, as you sit through this conversation, really be aware of the things that you're feeling. Are you feeling discomfort during this? And if so, what is it that that discomfort is coming from? Is it a part of what we're talking about? Is it the way you relate to your kids? Is it the fear that you may have to have these conversations with your kids? Um, are you even maybe possibly bringing up in yourself the times that you went through those things as a kid yourself and just trying to figure out what those emotions are but be open to that as we go through this process of talking through all of these different items and how they relate to you and your family all right so as we get started um and hopefully we can all agree that yes we are all trying to do the very best we can that includes our kiddos but for us as parents, it is definitely a complicated project. And some of those reasons you'll see on this screen, um, there's a lot going on in our culture today around identity in a million different directions, the systems that are in place, whether they're healthy or not, throw in a pandemic and racial division and an election year, um, it is very complicated for us. So we just wanna start with the reality that we are all trying to parent in the midst of. Um, and for the record, Craig and I are both also raising teenagers right along with you. Um, all right, so let's dive in on the next slide. 
So it looks like we're missing one of our S's. So our S's are seen, safe, soothed, and the fourth one is going to be secure. Um, sorry, I don't, I don't know where it went, but secure is number four. Um, what we want to remember as parents is attachment is a lifelong process. So it started back in utero and it doesn't stop until really ever if we're faith-based um, human beings. I don't think attachment ever stops. Um, we always need an attachment figure. And so that's going to become abundantly clear why we're talking about that as we overlay attachment to what's happening in the adolescent brain. But as far as the basics, what it means to be seen is that you, my teenager, are more than your behaviors. I can see the essence of you beyond any behaviors that we might be wrestling with. Um, to be safe means that you, my teenager, can be the real you and that you can trust me to love whatever that might be at any given moment. Um, may not love the behavior, but love you, the child of God. Um, soothed means that you can trust me as your parent. This one's a kicker to stay calm so that I am able to care for you and in that moment focus on your needs and not mine. Um, a lot of times, like Craig was talking about, when our old stuff from childhood comes up, we shift and try to get our needs met rather than being able to stay present with our kiddos and focused on what they might need at any given moment. And then the last one is secure. And that means that my teenager can trust that I am going to show up consistently, I'm going to have consistent expectations, and I am going to be able to be a presence in their life that they can count on. So those are our four S's. And then if we want to go to the next slide. Jen, I'm going to interrupt you for just a sec. I Absolutely. think that soothed one is a really big one. And as people are sitting there trying to register what that really means, that as I look at my past self and dealt things that that brings up. Can you give a, an example of that just to kind of help people? Cause we may not be aware when we have those things either. Absolutely. Um, so things that will pop up when we are working with kids and then invite parents into the therapy room. Um, if a, a child of yours maybe escalates and their volume goes up and they yell, and you as a child were raised in a home where maybe one of your caregivers was a yeller, you have the possibility of being triggered in that moment to go back to however you survived as a child, which for most of us is either yell back or run away. Well, if I'm the parent in this situation with my teenager who has raised their volume and I run away or I yell back, we're never going to meet the need of that child in that moment. And so it's important for me to work really hard to stay with my kid and have empathy for what's happening. Doesn't mean I have to be a punching bag or be disrespected. I can set boundaries, but I don't want to revert back to how I survived as a child running away or yelling. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm just going to answer for everybody and say that was great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so on development. When our kiddos are younger and when we were younger, it makes sense that we hope to be able to attach to our parents. Those can be healthy attachments, those can be unhealthy attachments. Um, if you're interested in that, reach out to us, we can give you lots of resources. Um, but as our kids hit adolescence, which is currently defined as 12 to 25, it's a big old phase of life. Um, they're biologically driven to shift towards attaching to their peers over attaching to us as parents. We innately have this drive to do that because subconsciously we understand those are the people that I'm going to have to depend on when I leave my home. So early in life, family of origin is our, our pack. As they hit adolescence, their pack becomes their peers. So that's why they put more energy into trying to connect 
with their peers and they don't want to be at home as much with us and they don't necessarily seek out our advice they're going to seek out advice of their of, of their peers it's a biological drive that they really they can't undo um, and it, it does make sense and it is about survival um, another shift that i think is really helpful for us as parents to understand is that their circadian rhythm during that 12 to 25 year range shifts by about two hours. So you and I want to be in bed because we're wiped out by 10 or 11 o'clock at night. They're still wide awake. They don't hit that lapse in energy until midnight or 1 a.m. Hence, they want to study later. Then it makes sense for us to want to do things that use our brain and they want to stay up later. And then on the other side of that, they want to sleep in later. Um, so you can see how what's happening for them developmentally can drive a whole lot of conflict if I, as mom or dad, don't understand that. Um, the final thing is this idea of their brains being like a Porsche with no brakes. The no-no part of an adolescent's brain, the part in the prefrontal cortex that helps them sequence and reason is not yet fully developed and will not be until 23, 24, 25 years old. Why that's important for us to know is when they're escalated, it's really impossible for them to hear us in that moment. And so we've got to kind of be the brakes, but a break with no clutch doesn't serve either of us very well that's where we get into shaming. So they're escalated. I get frustrated. I throw out some verbal zingers. You know, why can't you just be like your sister? Those kinds of things. That's, a, uh, that's me slamming on the brakes with no clutch. And I have shamed my kiddo, which disconnects us emotionally. Um, so there is a whole lot happening. We could spend hours talking just about the adolescent brain. Um, but high level, these are things that are really helpful for us as mom and dad to remember. Hey Jennifer, when you're talking about your their shift towards peers and that pack, what would you say to a parent who's trying to be a part of that pack? So they don't want us to be. <laughs> um, you know, we that's not our purpose or our role in their life. I think as they get old, older teens, we do shift from parenting to more partnering with them in that journey, but especially our younger teens, late middle school, high school kiddos, um, the more you try to insert yourself, probably the more they're going to oppose or defy your presence. And so they need space, give them space, let them go to their rooms. We don't want them hibernating there, but certainly it makes sense for them to want to be in their rooms, have some alone time, want some privacy. That doesn't necessarily equate to their up to at risk behaviors. It's developmentally normal for them to want those things. All right, Craig, I'm gonna to toss it back to you. All right, so what we know, we cannot give our children what we don't have. So we've got to have these skills in ourselves. We've got to be prepared within ourselves to be able to do these things. And we can't share things with them if we don't have it. Uh, we need to model what we want to see and hear from them. So instead of the arguments, the, you know, the break, the no, the no clutch, the breaks incident that we're talking about there, we need to model from them that calm behavior that we want to see from them. If we freak out at everything, we have to expect that they're going to freak out at everything. Um, our ability to regulate our own emotions is what supports their ability to stay calm. That co-regulation where the storm meets our calm, that's what I'm talking about. When we spin up, they spin up. So if we don't spin up and we stay calm and cool, it's a lot easier for them to match that energy and stay with us where we're at. So we believe that being known and being loved doesn't have prerequisites. We need to tell our kids and show our kids that we love them, whether they get straight A's or not, whether they make captain of the football team, first chair in band, 
whether they're gay or straight, whether their skills are mostly in Minecraft. We still need to accept them and meet them where they're at and not show them that we don't accept them because of what they haven't accomplished. So that's just that big part of meeting them where they are and making sure they know, feel known and loved for who and what they are. So that next part, when we miss that, is the, uh, is the answer we get, I'm fine, right? So that next slide there, there we go. What we do when we, when we don't accept them for who and what they are, we tell them that maybe when they're sad or hurt or depressed, confused, lonely, unloved, judged, misunderstood, insignificant, we tell them that's not okay. That's not okay. And we don't love you through that. So they instead come out with, I'm fine. They don't say any of those things and they don't share with us anymore because we've made it unsafe for them to do so. So we've got to give them that space and show them when it's insignificant, that it's okay for them to share so that when it is significant, they know we're going to be there. What would you say to a parent who hasn't done well with that maybe early on, but you know, they, they want to, they want to, they want to make that shift. So in that, I think being vulnerable with your kids is huge. Kids respect vulnerability. If you can come to your kids and say, in the past, we've not done a good job. I've not done a good job of listening, of being there for you when you needed me. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't do that. I'm sorry that I didn't treat those things as important, but I want to be able to do that. So giving them the freedom to say, you know, if, if you feel like I'm not being sensitive, if you feel like I'm not really listening, please tell me so we can talk about it. Uh, the second half of that though, is that you've got to do that then. You can't say, well, I've, I've done a bad job, I'll do better. And then when they say, hey, one of, this is one of those times I feel like you're not listening. And you say, well, that's because I don't have to listen because I'm the parent. Then we just throw it all back out the window. Right. I think also it's helpful for us around the what we know, um, that inner voice that we all have that carries throughout our entire lives ties back to what we were, what was reflected back to us by primary caregivers, coaches, teachers during childhood. So if I am shaming my children, um, not accepting my children, or I know that that's happening in a school environment or a sports club that they're a part of, and I'm not helping buffer that, they internalize that and years of internalization then becomes this pretty toxic inner critic, um, which, you know, is unfortunately a lot of the work that we do with adults and doing that inner voice that when we ask, you know, whose, whose voice are you hearing these thoughts in? Unfortunately, it oftentimes goes back to mom or dad. And so, you know, we've got to really do some unpacking of that with adults. We're so mom we and dad right now and we can we can affect some change if we're willing to. And that's a good exercise, even for the parents that are on here. If you've got those insecurities, if you've got those things that come up for you, stop and listen. Who said that to you? Whose voice are you hearing that in? Because if it's someone other than your own voice, we probably have some work you need to do in that space. And doing your own work in that space will make it easier for you to then be accepting and be there for your kids. All righty. So our next slide, things we don't want to do as moms and dads. This one is super hard, but we don't want to personalize. So when they're escalated and, you know, I hate you, you're the worst parent in the world. I can't believe you won't let me go to whatever the event is. Um, I don't ever want to see you again. Really hard not to take that personally. But in that moment, yes, they're showing us an external version of anger, but internally, if we go back to what we know is happening developmentally, most often it's rooted in fear. So fear, if I don't get to go to that party, I'm not going to be accepted by that pack. I mean, when we take that to its most extreme, if I'm not accepted by my pack, I don't survive. 
So the, the no-no part of the brain, not fully developed, can easily get our kids to that survival instinct pretty quickly. So for me as mom, when my child is upset that I've said no and they can't go, for me to have that information and be able to say, I know this is really hard. It's okay for you to be angry at me. It's not okay for you to, you know, cuss at me or swing at me if you have kids that are actor outers. Um, it is okay for you to be angry. I love you enough that no is the answer. And happy to chat with you about that if you want to. I don't want to take it personally because then I've missed an opportunity to connect with my kiddo. I also don't want to assume the worst. So back to developmentally, they it makes sense for them to want to be alone in their rooms. I don't want to assume the worst about the things that they might be doing in their rooms. Just have conversations with them. Periodically pop in, knock first because we all appreciate that, but you don't have to knock and wait five minutes. Knock and go on in. Pop in and you know make yourself seen and known, but oftentimes our brain just wants to fill in the blank in a story and it doesn't care about um, whether what we're filling it in with is fact or not. So I wanna be generous in my assumptions with my teenager. I also want to be super careful not to invalidate his or her feelings. Whatever they're feeling, I don't have to agree with it, but it's it's not wrong. It's their emotion. All emotions are God-given. So I just want to reflect it back to them, and we're going to give you guys some tools of how to do that. I also don't want to withdraw my love. I hear this one a whole lot, and I think it does go back to maybe what was taught to us as kids. But when those emotions get high or my teenager isn't maybe behaving the way I think that they need to be behaving, I don't want to retreat, give them the silent treatment, um, not offer hugs, not offer conversation, all of those things. Don't want to use the shaming comments, how could you do this to me? That certainly will invite shame in. When I say things like, don't you know how much I worry about you, or you make me so angry, you're going to make me lose my mind, those are unhealthy emotional boundaries. I'm making my emotions dependent on my kiddo. That's not how emotions are intended to work. Um, my emotions are in my hula hoop, my responsibility to understand and manage. The same is true for my teenager, but they're still learning. So it's really important for me to try to be the regulated adult in those moments, be responsible for my, if I'm angry, I'm gonna say, you know, I'm feeling really upset right now. I'm gonna need to pause the conversation. Let's revisit this. I'll come knock on your door when I feel like I can have a conversation and be respectful towards you. There's nothing in the world wrong with me saying that to my kiddo because I hope that they're able to do the same for me. Um, this last one, You've heard us talk about shame a little bit tonight. Disappointment is the Trojan horse of shame. So if I say to my kiddo, I'm disappointed in you, super big shame spiral for my child. Um, it's okay for me to be disappointed in a choice that you have made, or you know, I'm feeling sad that you made a D on your algebra test because I believe that you are capable of more, but let's figure out how to help you believe that you're capable of more. I don't ever want to say to my child, I am disappointed in you. They are a creation of God created in his image. They are not a disappointment. And so we want to be very cautious there. All right. So before we go to the do's, just to kind of really cement the importance of this because we've looked at the I'm fine principles. We've looked at the, you know, statements that can be disqualifying that lead our kids to not share with us. We've looked at a lot of the don'ts, but to share some stats with you guys on kind of what the gravity is of really getting these dues right. We looked up some things for this and, you know, one in five teens right now is suffering from some type of mental health disorder. 11% uh, have a major depressive, have had a major depressive episode in the last year. 
30% of teens meet criteria for an anxiety disorder. That's one in three, which means if you have three kids in your house, you could have easily have one that is, which I'm sure seems like a high number, but when you add in a pandemic and everything else, the stats on that have now doubled. So it's not 30% of teens are meeting that criteria for anxiety, it's 60%. And that can be school, that could be pandemic, that could be all the things that are going on in the world. That's a high number. 35% um, have used marijuana, 14% have used other drugs, 55% have used alcohol, that's a huge amount of just different things that our kids are at risk for right now. So putting aside the don'ts and finding some do's now, these are really important to try to keep us out of those numbers. So some sample questions. Uh, does that, that sound blank? Tell me more. We're giving our kids the opportunity to tell us more about what they're feeling. Instead of trying to take a solution based, you know, practice with them where they say, I had a really bad day. Somebody was really mean to me instead of saying, well, you shouldn't talk to them anymore, which ends the conversation. We're empathizing with them, recognizing their emotion and saying, oh, wow, if find something they said in there was really hard because of this, that does sound hard. Tell me more. So we're engaging with them instead of ending the conversation by trying to solve the problem for them. I hear that this was blank, blank. Let's practice, create, brainstorm some steps that might help you. So, you know, even in that, you're empowering them by giving them some solutions based things where you can maybe even act out with them. If this were to happen, how could you react differently? What could we do that was different? Uh, I had a hard time um, as well with blank recently. This helped me get through it. So if you feel like they're open to you sharing, share an experience that you had. Show them that you're, again, you're being vulnerable with them. Show that vulnerability that just because I'm an adult, I still have problems too. This is something that one time worked for me. Uh, tell me how you're feeling. Just opening that conversation up to emotions. Dads, I'm gonna talk to you right now. Emotions are okay. It is okay for kids to cry. It is okay for boys to be sad. It is okay for girls to be sad. It's okay for you to be sad. It's okay for your kids to tell you something that makes you wanna cry, cry. Show them that you're a human. Show them that your emotions are not something to be afraid of. The more we encourage our kids to feel their feelings, the more healthy they're gonna be. Tell them that you wanna understand. You're again explaining that that openness is here. Please come to me with these things because I wanna be a part of your life. I love you even when you're angry. Man, that's a disarming statement. When somebody is so mad that they're yelling at you, that they're storming off and you're able to tell them calmly, you can't yell this up the stairs, just so you know, you can't yell, yeah, well, I love you even if you are angry. That doesn't work. You gotta stick, stick in your calm place and be able to say, it. well, you know what? I love you even if you're angry. Giving them the right to feel angry with you. It's okay to feel angry with me. It's okay that you're mad at me right now. I can handle that, but I love you anyway asking how you can help. Just simply opening the conversation to be more, not ending it with your advice, not ending it with them, opening it up to have a bigger conversation. I have some thoughts, are you open to hearing them right now? And that's that path to empathy that's not problem solving, but maybe this time they don't wanna just have you empathize, maybe they do want some suggestions, but you're giving them the right to tell you what they need and what they want. I'm sorry for blank, next time I'll blank. Maybe you screwed up one of these situations and they say, hey, this didn't, you know, this, this turned into something about you and I was talking about me. Take that moment to reflect and say, you know what, I'm sorry that I made it about me. Next time I'll make sure I listen better and be vulnerable. Let's go for a walk together. Always good, walk and talk, little exercise, little conversation, get some fresh air. I think there's one there that we can add to for you parents who like to go do something let's go get ice cream because I feel like ice cream makes everyone a little bit happier mm -hmm. and everybody knows that cold calcium is the best kind of calcium. So it's good for your bones, good for your energy, good way to end. Nice. I think it's helpful for us too, to remember um, emotions for us as all as human beings of any age have a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, we don't talk about this much, but they're like a tunnel. If I shut my kid down, 
when they're angry without allowing this conversation to happen and them to calm back down, they're staying stuck in the middle of the tunnel. And over time, that's where we get this buildup and, you know, our forties and fifties of people having cardiac problems due to stress and unprocessed emotions because they they're stuck in the tunnel. And so we've got to help ourselves first, but then our kids also get to the light at the end of the tunnel, get on the other side of the unpleasant emotions. Um, you know, again, all emotions are valid. Some are super unpleasant, but that doesn't mean that we aren't capable of processing them. Um, I also think it's helpful for us to remember we feel our feelings. We don't think our feelings. And so a lot of times when our kids are in a big emotion, we want them to be able to tell us the whole story right then. I'm asking them to think their feelings in that moment. That's why the walk or the drive or music or just being present initially is so helpful because I'm, I'm sitting with them and it movement helps us process all of those things help me then be able to think again. Um, but I, I really can't think my feelings. Um, so some helpful little tidbits. All right. So here's an acronym because who doesn't love a good acronym for you guys in the moment. Uh, we always as parents want to remember what it's like for them. We were teenagers. We managed to survive it. We were also teenagers without the added stress of social media, cell phones, 24 seven interaction. You know, if we had a fight with somebody at school, we had weekends off and things could cool down. Uh, they don't. It ramps up with social media right now. Um, and then this year, all the special things about 2020, they've got a lot happening. So we do want to recognize that um, while their circumstances may be different, it's still going to feel really big to them. Um, so us being willing to listen and be open, I'm, I may not be able to relate. I've never lived as a teenager in a pandemic with a cell phone and all of these things, but I can relate on an emotional level with my kiddos. Um, so me staying alert means my A means I'm going to acknowledge their stressors. Um, different than mine, but their mind and body response, not different. Same nervous system that I have, same repertoire of emotions that I have. So if I can connect with them there, we're gonna keep that emotional connection going. The L is listen. I'm gonna listen to my kiddo. I'm gonna notice how they respond as I try to involve myself. So back to trying to be one of the friends or peers or part of the pack. I wanna notice what happens when I say, hey, you and your boyfriend are going to a movie. How about dad and I join you? Do they bristle? Are they okay with it? And I want to respectfully respond to, to my child's cues. Um, e is encourage. I want to encourage my kiddo to express how they're feeling as well as what they're thinking. So making space for both. I think as parents, we immediately go to the, tell me what you're thinking. We like the story part, but we don't want to disregard the emotion. We don't want to disregard the emotion for ourselves either. Um, we, we were created to be able to have them for a reason. Um, so making that a safe thing. My R is recognize that they may have different experiences than their friends, their siblings, than I did as a teenager, and I'm not going to compare. Comparison steals joy. Comparison steals uniqueness. Comparison makes me unsafe. And so I really want to recognize them for who they were created to be. And then my T is tune into my own level of stress. So if I'm not managing my stress and saying no gracefully to things in my life, it's really unfair for me to expect my child to be able to do the same. So if we want to switch to that last slide, how I deal with my own stress 
time and time and time again, directly linked to how our kids are going to experience and manage his or hers. Um, so at the end of the day, if I am able to model healthy things and I am able to learn how to process and regulate my own emotions, then I am always teaching healthy things to my child. And that's our goal. Not that home is never going to be tense, but that we know how to navigate that in a healthy way. So that is what we have. We are open for questions. Um, I have a couple of questions already in here. So the first one is just any tips on getting your child to open up and discuss their day, their event that they participated in. I know a lot of a lot of times as parents, we kind of revert to news reporters. We're kind of give me the who, what, when, where, and why. Um, but what, what would you say to a parent who, who might be, you know, having a little bit of a struggle trying to get their students to just talk about their day or talk about an event? So I think it's helpful if I know details of my child's day. What are some of their favorite classes, difficult classes? I'm going to ask more specific but open-ended questions. You know, hey, I know um, you've been working a lot on geometry. How was geometry today? What do you think about the teacher? So I'm asking questions that are relevant to them. Um, that's how we're going to get more information. Because it's really hard for me to say, if someone asks me, what do I think about the teacher? I can't really say, okay. Like, it requires a little bit more than that, that greases the wheels, so to speak. Uh, also, it's important if they're talking, I need to be quiet. <laughs> I think that oftentimes is what we have a tendency to do. We get so excited that they're telling us something that we kind of bar barrage them with questions and then they shut down. Gotcha. Good. Craig, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Oh, I, I think that was great. I think the, uh, the one we want to avoid is the generalities. You know, Jen's talking about the specifics, but the general side of that that I think parents often fall into is the, how was school today? To which you will always get the answer, fine. Right. I didn't want to go. But, you know, mixing some of that with things you know they enjoy. Like I have one that hates, I think it's ELAR, but loves engineering. So making sure we open up maybe with a question about engineering. So we kind of get the ball rolling, excited talking, and yeah. then move into the subjects that are maybe something that's not as enjoyable. Right. Good. Um, another question came in. It said that, um, you know, it's, it's okay for kids to be alone in their room, right? Not, not forever, but just in there and not before entering. Um, but what if, you know, what if they have their, their computer, uh, I'm trying to trying to trying to summarize this question, but basically have their computer with it. It'd be real easy if you knock and then go in. It'd be real easy for them to shut their screen down or or change whatever they were looking at. And you've tried to set some boundaries, but they seem to be a little bit more comfortable, you know, in their room in that setting, whether they're playing a game or doing homework, that kind of stuff. What what are some? Do you have any ideas that might maybe address address that issue? Well, so I. I I'm a little bit of a dinosaur parent. Um, my kids weren't allowed to have phones or laptops in their rooms until their senior year in high school. Um, so we were, you know, it had to be where I could see it. Yes, technology is important. We are also the first generation of parents trying to weather the storm. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I tell them all the time. I have nothing to go on other than my gut. And my gut is that this has the potential to be a weapon of mass destruction. And I know that the no, no part of your brain isn't fully developed. So sometimes I have to be the brakes. And so, you know, it, it's a process that we're going to have to learn to trust each other. If that cat is already out of the bag, then, you know, you making sure as parents that you do have appropriate filters on what is able to be searched and viewed when in your house, um, also helpful. Um, and you can shut them down. You know, they can't access the internet after a certain time at night and all of those things. I think that it is our responsibility as parents 
to manage technology in our homes. All right. So my kids um, are a little bit different. Um, I have little ones now too, and mine are 11, 13, and 17. My 17 year old, you know, we've been through all of it and we trust pretty well, but my 11 year old, my 13 year old, ever since they've had technology, the rule has been when you go to bed, all of the chargers for computers, for phones, for everything lives in the office downstairs. All technology is put in the office to charge at night. So there's no technology in the rooms overnight, which can be one of the more tempting times to do things you're not supposed to do. Um, you know, especially in this time right now, I've got two that are doing online school. So to tell them they couldn't have computers or anything in their room would be pretty difficult. Um, you know, we have filters set up to catch porn sites and things like that. But we also have the understanding when everything was set up that I have all of your passwords and I know how to do all of these tricky things. Whether you do or not, they don't know that. To see all of the things that you're doing so, you know, just know that we have that transparency that I can log into your things anytime I want to. I have all your passwords and can look at things if you give me a reason to. Yeah. Um, what are some of the, th I mean, I realize this is a huge question. So, but as, as counselors who are seeing clients almost every day um, and seeing adolescents, teenagers, what are some, what are, what are some of the things that you're seeing now that you would say as parents, hey, I'm seeing a lot of this. Um, not, not necessarily watch out for this, but just be aware that this is something that, that your teenager may be struggling with. And, and, it, and it could be having to do with communication, connection. It could be with, with emotions and regulation, those types of things. But what would you say or maybe both of you answer this question, uh, one or two things, you know, I don't want you to, this could, you could answer this one forever, but just one or two things that you would say, I, I see a lot of this in my office and, and, and it just, it, it, it bugs you or it's concerning to you as a, as a counselor, but also as a, as a, a, a parent. Um, I think my number one that I see that is disheartening is a sense of futility in our teenagers. Mm. And this was even pre-COVID, which has definitely made it worse. But I would have 16, 17, 18-year-olds pretty regularly talk to me about, I don't want to grow up. Mm -hmm. I come home and I hear my parents talking about how miserable they are with their jobs or stressed about bills. Why would I want to grow up? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that is, it's heartbreaking mm -hmm. to think about these kids who were saying, you know, go and learn and spread your wings, yet we're modeling something that they don't want a part of at all. Mm. So I would say that, and then specific to this year, anxiety to the point of trauma response. A lot of our teenagers are having, and all of us really, um, what are trauma responses to the current environment in which we are living? And so, you know, we are doing a whole lot of education on that because that then normalizes what's happening for me. I'm not losing my mind. Mm -hmm. it, my nervous system is just so dysregulated. And so then we learn how to re-regulate and what all that means. Gotcha. Thanks. Craig, how about you? Jen's answers were really deep. Mine are going to be less deep than that. Um, <laughs> a couple of mine are more about in this time, make sure your kids have the ability to connect with other people. Um, one of the things that I keep hearing a lot is my parents got mad at me. So they took the cord from my PlayStation, but I'm doing online school. And the only friends that I get to connect with are in my games. So we think that we're punishing by removing this negative thing, but really what we're doing is disconnecting them even further. And so as Jen talked about during this time when we're in a pandemic, when kids are home all day and they have no way to connect, we're taking away the only thing that they have. And it makes it really hard for them to feel like they're still a part of anything, which then mm -hmm. is gonna lead to that, those depressive symptoms and some scary places. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing with that is social media. You know, I have parents that range in social media from Snapchat is the devil to parents who think that all social media is the devil. But the truth is that is where their peers are. 
And so again, talking about to your kids, talking about how to use these things responsibly, they can be social interactions for them and the ability for them to connect with others when they don't have any other ability to. And so when we cut that out entirely or we don't allow anything at all, we tell them that those relationships are not valuable. So come sit at the table with mom and do a puzzle, but you know, that's good, but it isn't enough. Mm. That's good. That's good. Um, so another question that's, that's in here is how do you have, <laughs> how do you have, I'm trying to summarize here. How do you have difficult conversations? In other words, you know, you're going to have these conversations, but you also know you're not going to like the answer. Does that make sense? Um, so, um, because you see, uh, maybe you see behavior that's going on and, and you really want to, you, you want to approach those. So how do you approach, um, maybe that's a better way to say, how do you approach a difficult conversation with your teenager where you, you're not going to like what you hear, but there's a good chance they're not going to want to hear your response either. But you know what I'm saying? You have to have those conversations. I'm going to jump the gun on this one and start first. Um, for me, love is a one size fits all solution. So if it's a hard conversation, start with I love you. Start with caring and hearing their emotions in the way that they're processing that and love them no matter what they say. Maybe they're mm -hmm. struggling with their sexual identity. We hear that all the time. And the response that we get often is one of judgment and one of anger from parents. And you may not like that your kid is going through this, but you being angry is just telling them that one more time they're not acceptable. So no matter what the issue is, showing up and caring and loving first and reminding them that no matter what they say, no matter what their answer is, you're still going to love them and treat them the same. And I would add, I think us being honest, you know, hey, I want to talk to you about something and I know it's probably going to be really uncomfortable for both of us. And so I might mess up and I want you to know that you have permission to let me know if something I said is hurtful or stings. I'm asking that you stay engaged with me so that we can talk about this. Yeah. I think us just being that real and honest with our kids sets the stage for the repair work that probably needs to happen. Also having those conversations from a place of concern instead of condemnation. Um, you know, I can't believe I heard this or I think this is what's happening. Again, we don't want to assume. So, you know, hey, if you're worried your kids are drinking or doing drugs, I've noticed some things that seem out of character from the you that I have gotten to know over the past 13 years or 15 years. And I'm really concerned that this might be the reason. Mm. That's very different than next door, David called and told me you were having a beer, you right. know, kind of the freak out conversation. Gotcha. That's good. Less blame. Uh, yeah. Say it again. Less blame. Less blame. Okay. Another question, this has to do with dating. What are, what are good rules for this, for dating? And um, if we allow them being alone at the home, which I, I'm assuming since it's talking about dating, maybe then with their date. So there you go. What are the good rules for this? And if we allow them for being home, being alone at home? Um, well, I'll, I'll start. I'm the mom of two girls. Um, 120, 117. And so we're created to be sexual beings. Makes sense that we are going to have crushes and attractions and all of those things. So I think step number one is start talking about it early. I mean, when they're little and watching Disney princess movies, what do you think you might want in a life partner someday? You can, we can start to ask those questions early. So we're setting the stage that this is an okay conversation to have. Logistics, um, you know, our, the kids where we live right now seem to start having crushes earlier than I remember having them. But again, I, I want conversation around it to be safe. So I don't want to immediately tell them you're too young. 
I think that's one of the most damaging things we can say to a kid. Use the prompts. Tell me more about that. What do you like about that person? How does that person make you feel special? As far as dating, um, usually we recommend car date, you know, not until you're able to drive or close to it. Um, I can tell you, I mean, I told you the ages of mine, they still don't stay at home alone with significant others. Um, never allowed in their rooms, mm -hmm. significant others. That doesn't mean that you can't have privacy in another part of the house, but door stays open. And no, they can't be here when mom and dad aren't home. Um, I can't control everything, but I absolutely can set and model um, our values under our roof. Gotcha. So, sure. Craig, Thanks. you have a mixed gender household. With I have a mixed gender household, but none of my children have interest in dating at this point. My 17 year old has not found that boy yet. So I am really good with where things are at. <laughs> um, I would agree everything Jen says, and I hope in the future that that will be my rules. <laughs> um, right now I don't have to have those, but what we have had is conversations um, about sex with our 17 year old. I left this part to my wife only because I didn't want to be the awkward guy at that moment, um, but doesn't have to be the way it is. She's 17 and just relates better to mom. So that worked out. But the, the important part of that is I think we need to make sure the kids understand that the sex part of this, and that's what we're afraid of, we want to make it not a demonized shaming thing because we go from telling our kids, you know, we, we don't want, we want them to be abstinent. We don't want them to have sex till marriage. We want all these things, but then we expect them the day they get married for this thing that we've told them is bad. And, you know, you shouldn't do this and all these things. If that's what you're telling them, we then expect them to be able to go then, Oh, I'm married. So now it's fine. But the shame and things that that creates around their body can create around sex itself can be really hard to change. So having that open conversation about, you know, this is something that if you do, you're giving a piece of, of yourself away. And there is, there is baggage that goes with that. There are ramifications for that. Not making it a shameful conversation, but an understanding of what the emotional and mental ramifications are that go with that. So they can navigate that for themselves a little bit better with an understanding of it's not just no, but this is why. I, hard no's with no why's are really difficult things for kids because they do have questions. So when we can elaborate on the why, we can make the no be more of a choice and not just a command. Sure. Uh, if you have a child who is a people pleaser, how do you teach them to set boundaries? Super fun. Um, so one of the assignments that I will give to my people pleasers is you don't get to apologize. You don't get to say, I'm sorry. Mm. And we have a, a handout that I'm happy to send to you, Jimmy, if you want to mm -hmm. share it, but okay. alternatives to apologizing because you can tally how many times a day people pleasers do that. And so instead we're shifting to thank you for being patient with me you know, thank you for helping me do this instead of, I'm sorry, I had to ask or whatever the circumstances. So little things like that create awareness, which is where change begins. Um, mm. The other thing I teach kids is, again, back to the emotional boundaries. Oftentimes that's where people pleasing originates is we don't know what to do with unpleasant emotion or someone has been upset with us and we felt shame or that we were responsible for their emotions. And so teaching them that we were intended to simply be a mirror to other people. And so practicing within the household or, you know, with safe others, how to be that mirror. Sounds like you're really upset right now. I can see you're mad at me. Can we talk about it? Those kinds of things. If I am modeling that, then that's what my child's going to begin to internalize. Um, so being curious about maybe where it came from, have they experienced shame either at home or a lot of times it happens at school because people pleasing is a shame response. So. I don't have anything to add to that one. That was perfect. All right. 
Any other questions, parents? Now is your chance. Okay. Well, I appreciate you two coming on here and uh, sharing this time with us. Uh, Jennifer shared a couple of uh, resources with me. And I have one of them here. It is called Brainstorm, The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain uh, by Dan Siegel. Uh, he's a good author. Some of you, he, he has a, several books out, but um, I'm going give to this, give this away. And I haven't figured out how to give it away yet. So um, I wrote the names down. Jen, if you pick a number between one and 10, please. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Sarah Chacon, congratulations. You are the winner of Brainstorm. I will get that to you. And the other book that I ordered is not in yet. And I don't even remember the title. Jen, do you remember the title of the book? I'm trying to remember. Oh. Ask me um, what I sent to you. Yeah, my, my, um, that's my. Oh, we have a follow up. What do you mean shame response for people pleasing? So shame is um, full body experience. Um, it's not just an emotional thing. We feel it in our body. What, what we, the fascinating thing about shame is the part of our brain that experiences physical pain lights up when we are experiencing shame. So it is a very real phenomenon for all of us. There are three shields that we use to try to protect ourselves from experiencing shame. One of those is people pleasing or over responsibility. We can also retreat or withdraw, just like disconnect from whatever's happening that's shaming me, or I can attack back. Those are my three responses. Um, so over-responsibility and people-pleasing is an attempt to not experience shame. Does that help, parent? Hope so. Okay. Um, all right, one more time. This time, Craig, pick a number between, uh, but you can't pick seven. So any other number between one and 10? Uh, four. Four. One, two, three, four. Hey, the Gwees, you are going to get whatever mystery resource it is because I can't remember what she recommended. But as soon as it comes in, I will get it to you guys. Um, oh, one more question. Here we go. Oh, they responded. Woohoo. Never mind. It wasn't a question. <laughs> It was a, it was a, it was an excitement. All right. Well, Jennifer and Craig, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. Again, it's planting seeds, TX, right? NTX. NorthTexasNTX.com. Yep. Okay. Planting seeds, NorthTexas.com. I've sent several people um, their way, and they're a great, they're a great group. Um, everyone is a, a, if I'm not mistaken, everyone is a believer on your staff. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And so they do uh, definitely do uh, Christian counseling, uh, but also they work with other clients who aren't believers as well. So um, highly recommend them to you. Anyway, um, parents, thanks for joining us. And uh, parents, just so you'll know, November 1st, um, we're doing, not November 1st, that's, that's today. In two weeks, which would be November, what, is that 15? We're going to have another webinar uh, from someone else from Planting Seeds. Todd Mead is going to do a, a webinar on uh, pornography. Uh, and so I know we have a lot of people who are, who are um, a lot of kids who are walking through that, a lot of parents who are, are worried about that or their, their kids have already experienced that. So what do I do now? So um, he's gonna give us a presentation. We'll do some Q and A just like this, but uh, anyway, and Chris Jones, thanks for being behind the scenes and making all this happen for us. So anyway, thank you for coming. And uh, again, Jennifer, Craig, thank you so much for, for doing this for us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks All for right, the opportunity. Have a great night. All right. Bye-bye.